So we're in for a very special evening. I want to tell you there may be one thing missing for this evening, and if any of you don't have them, we have them here for you, but you have to come up front, and that is, this is going to be an evening where you're going to want at least one handkerchief. Because the tributes that you're going to hear to Murray tonight are ones which speak to his greatness as well to, as to things that you'll find quite sentimental. Uh, Murray, in my mind, is one of the great journalists of the last century and one of the great teachers of both the last century and this century. And you'll hear a lot about that today. You'll hear about the ways in which Murray has inspired so many people and continues to be loved by so many people and about his remarkable family and how terrific they are and have been and how wonderful he's been as a dad and a husband. But before we start, I'm going to have one unscripted moment, and that is there are a couple of elected officials here who come bearing gifts. Of course, we're all used to that. And so Zev Yaroslavsky brought, has come here with a plaque. I refused to let him read the plaque or even show the plaque. I said to Zev, you're here, Howard Berman's here, Mel Levine's here. Zev, just say a word from your heart. Well, thank, thank you, and I'm, I'm happy to do that uh, because uh, plaques come and go, but there's only one Murray Fromson, and, and Murray Fromson and I, even though he didn't know me then, uh, go back a long time. Before I was, as they say, honorable, uh, I, a after I graduated uh, from college and graduate school, I ran the Southern California Council for Soviet Jews, and uh, in the it was a human rights organization promoting the emigration, the free emigration of Jews from the Soviet Union. Uh, we didn't have a lot of contacts, other, uh, other Western contacts in, in, in Moscow, but the correspondents, uh, the, the handful of correspondents over the years who uh, risked their own necks uh, to uh, carry, me I wouldn't say carry messages, to transmit messages, to uh, park stuff, to uh, pick get dissidents to pick up stuff, messages, uh, memos, whatever, uh, you could count on your hand the, uh, the number of, of Western correspondents who would do that. One of them was a legendary CBS correspondent in Moscow by the name of Murray Fromson. That's how I first got to know his name. He was, uh, he, he reported from Moscow. Uh, the word got around in our movement that Murray is the kind of guy uh, that if you, you need help, look him up. And uh, uh, and he made a huge difference for uh, for a lot of, a lot of people, and I won't go into any further detail in the interest of time, but Murray, uh, you were a correspondent in Moscow. I just asked you what the years were, and I was close, 72 through 74. Those were momentous years for the human rights movement in the Soviet Union, big time uh, years. A lot changed between 72 and 74. Uh, a lot because of the courage. Uh, in the passion and compassion of people like yourself. So on a personal level, of course, you become, you and Dodie have become friends of Barbara's and mine long after that. But for what you did back then, thank you. Thank you, Zev. Murray, you can leave this in a box for now and open it later. Uh, we, have, we, have, uh, we have an amazing program for you this evening, but I want to um, say that Murray, one of the things that Murray did so well was to serve as the director of the School of Journalism here at USC. You'll hear a lot of things about different parts of his career, but as far as I'm concerned, uh, Murray had a crucial role in building this school into what we hope is, we believe, is one of the great schools of journalism in the world. And Murray, you did a spectacular job, and your successor, uh, Michael Parks, Pulitzer Prize winner from South Africa, uh, from his reporting from South Africa, and former editor-in-chief of the Los Angeles Times, the current director of the journalism school has a few words to say. Michael. Thanks. Uh, you took me back, Zev. Um, I was in Moscow then. That's where I met Murray and Dodie. We were neighbors. Eliza babysat for our children. Derek was a rascal. maybe still is. <laughs> Tonight is, I think, looking at the audience, and Murray, I've got to thank you for assembling so many of my old friends. Um, 
Tonight's a little bit like that old program, and I don't know the network, but this is your life. Well, we needed Ralph Edwards, who I think has maybe passed on. But we found somebody we think will be even better. Peter Shaplin. Now, now let me tell you who Peter Shaplin is. He's well connected. He's the son of Bob Shaplin the legendary New Yorker correspondent in Asia. He lived down the hall from me at the Continental Palace in Saigon. I used to visit him when, I know, I, I promised Lisa I wasn't going to talk about when you were young, but when he was younger. Um, but his grandfather was a correspondent for the New York Times and the Herald Tribune. His daughter is a student here. So he's well connected. And Murray knew him when. But Peter has other attributes. He was the desk assistant for Walter Cronkite. He worked at CBS when it was the Tiffany Network. And now, in his new self-employed role, he reports, students, are you listening? He reports, he produces, he shoots his own stuff for, among others, um, the ABC program we used to call the Jennings program, the World News Tonight. He does other things too. We needed a ringmaster, we thought, okay? It's gonna be a big evening, so we needed a ringmaster. Who better than the media coordinator for the Michael Jackson trial? <laughs> the Scott Peterson trial. So Peter, be our ringmaster. Um, thank you very much. Murray, the first voice you hear will not be your 11th grade English teacher, but, but, I, but I do have a binder, and I will be going through a number of, a number of clips. Thank you all very much, uh, Dean Cowan, Director Parks, Murray, Doty, Eliza, Derek, Shai, Ileana, ladies and gentlemen, and my daughter, Lee. I've known Murray for about 39 and a half years, one journalist that you'll be hearing from shortly has known Murray for a half century. Michael and Murray date back to the 70s in Moscow. Uh, Marty and Larry Rosen, who are here in the audience, they went to high school with Murray in the Bronx. By comparison, I'm a mere adolescent. There are also some colleagues here who know Murray in very special ways. CBS cameraman Jerry Sims is here. They covered the Vietnam War together. Uh, as did another Pulitzer Prize winning photographer, Nick Ott is here as well. And here in these trenches at Annenberg, still Lopez, who's been Murray's aide de camp for low these many years. So by comparison, I really do feel very privileged and I thank you. I first, did, I first met Murray when visiting my father, Bob Shaplin, out in Hong Kong. He would have loved to have been here tonight. He's here with me. Indulge me for just a moment because I want to give you a quick perspective of some of the stories of Murray's media career. A couple of story headlines. Chowchilla kidnapped. Patty Hearst. Reagan campaigns. Oh, there are too many to count. There are so many stories that have a Murray byline or out cue. Going back, listen to some of these. The Goldwater campaign. Tonkin Golf. The Trial of the Chicago Seven, the Selma Civil Rights March, and the resulting voter rights legislation stories that, of course, follow that. And tonight is an appreciation of your amazing and rich career, a journey that has taken you and your family literally around the world. And a couple of days ago, I did ask Dodie, who kindly furnished a 
couple of addresses of this journey. I'm going to mangle the addresses. From Los Angeles to South Bay Road on Hong Kong to 52-1 Soy in Sukhumvit, Bangkok. I got the Bangkok part right. Hatton House in Hong Kong, also to Moscow, and ultimately back here to Los Angeles and to the Annenberg School. So with all of these addresses, and not to make it too modern, I've coined a phrase for tonight's event, welcome to your change of address party. <laughs> I stopped at the Larkspur Post Office, the <laughs> it's hard to do this without having some fun with it. I call it that because it really is hardly a goodbye. It's really an acknowledgement of you as a journalist and teacher, a judge for both the Pulitzers and the Selden Ring Prize, a Shorenstein Fellow at Harvard, an author and a friend. Now there are many colleagues who are here, many more who wanted to be. Some of them have sent reminiscences and audio and video and email. I'm gonna have the opportunity to read a few of those and certainly to show you some on the screen. And by the way, all of these are on a very special website, which is in your program, but it's the annenberg.edu, uh, uh, usc.edu forward slash Murray. It is in the program correctly. And special thanks to Jeff Baum and his team here at USC for their gifts of the skill of their craft, their admiration in producing tonight's program and setting up the Frompson uh, archive. I was initially asked to speak about Murray because I sort of straddle this professional and personal friend and I'm just gonna take a moment from my own, my own thoughts, very briefly, uh, which really date from when Murray and I worked together at the CBS News Bureau here in Los Angeles. And there were personalities there, some larger than life correspondents who produced when time was, they produced only when time was of no consequence, could consume resources at a voracious clip. There were also the newbies, often freshly picked from the obscurity of some local newsroom. They were deemed network ready. They were eager, aggressive, and in some cases more like stunned deer in the headlights. One never knew quite what they could deliver. And then there were the true veterans the pros, the correspondence. Oh, and by the way, it is correspondence, please. When you got to that level, CBS didn't call you a reporter. You were a correspondent. And if the others were derogatorily referred to by the young Turks like myself to be the children, the pros were the adults, the men and women who you could count on one hand who would never let you down, never fail to deliver the story, the right story. And they were, and they will always be, the true nugget, the bench strength of the Tiffany Network. And Murray, you, you were and you are that nugget, that gem to me. So to some clips. A few that you may have never seen, a few more that you, I hope, will enjoy savoring once more. They're war stories. Murray certainly had his share of them in Asia, from Jakarta to Da Nang, Quezon, all covered by Fromson. Remember the Pueblo in North Korea? A Fromson story. That Chinese New Year's weekend in Saigon? Tet? Yeah, Fromson too. Journalists are called upon to cover war stories as well as stories about disasters and tragedies, we witness profound sadness, pain, and heartache, and stories of great human emotion, the pathos. Often the pictures of those are so compelling as to risk overwhelming any narration whatsoever, no matter how lean or sparse or words well chosen. But rarely do all three occur in the same story. We're gonna play a piece from April 5th, 1975 from the Cronkite News. I wanna call your attention to the narration. It begins as a joyous celebration of a story and it changes. Murray captures that. He's, his own craft is evident. His script is precise. And the piece ends after an awkward moment of perhaps a split second, and I invite you to listen for it, with a narration with the tagline 
that actually caused more than a few raised eyeballs at CBS. So we begin with a perfect storm, a correspondence trifecta. Because in this one story, you will witness the breadth and character of the reporting skill that Murray brought to his work, April 5th, 1975, in even the most awful of moments. In South Vietnam today, a ghastly chapter was added to the pathos of war that has gripped that country for the past 30 years. A huge C-5 Air Force cargo plane carrying 243 South Vietnamese orphans to the United States, the first in the government-ordered airlift, crashed in a rice paddy near Saigon just minutes after takeoff. More than half the children and as many as 40 of the 62 escorts and crew aboard were killed. Murray Frompson reports. The Orphan's Airlift was considered a victory over red tape. It took an order from President Ford to dispatch the C-5A to Saigon. Then the agreement of Vietnamese authorities to expedite passports and exit visas for the orphans. Some of those put aboard the plane had been born only weeks ago. Most seemed to be between the ages of two and eight. Some sat along the side of the plane. Others were strapped to the floor, more terrified of the television lights than their first trip in an airplane. Wives of American officials being evacuated home with their own children agreed to act as chaperones to the orphans. Destination, the West Coast, and then onward to American families who had already begun the adoption process. Two hours ago, I watched this airplane take off from Tonsonot Air Base. It was a perfect takeoff, carrying those orphans to the United States. What can one say except when will the misery in this country ever stop? The huge plane crashed into a field about five miles from the end of the runway, near a small village in Jaden province. There were pieces of wreckage scattered across a half a mile of rice paddy. A fire was slowly burning itself out near the engines. Smashed bodies or parts of them were uncovered by Vietnamese Air Force crews and American officials who rushed to the scene. It was like a combat operation. Helicopters hovered overhead. Body bags were used to remove corpses for identification purposes. A hand here, a head there, shirts, books, diapers, all too grotesque to describe further. Vietnamese soldiers stood guard and said nothing. Villagers watched from a nearby railroad crossing. Other helicopters came back to Tonsonu Air Base where the ill-fated trip had begun. American and Vietnamese volunteers removed some of the body bags and other bodies wrapped in white sheets. Scores of ambulances rushed survivors to a nearby hospital. Some of the chaperones were in a state of shock. Moments before, they had been happy to be leaving Saigon. The orphans were to be the first of 2,000 to be airlifted out of Vietnam. Many were mixed blood the children of Vietnamese women and black American GIs. They would never have had a chance for happiness in Vietnam, where racial prejudice is as strong as in any other country. Now, they have no chance at all. Murray Thompson, CBS News, in Jaden Province. What I was just hearing, I was about to say that, what many of you would not know was that Dodi was queried by the embassy in Hong Kong to be aboard that flight and was waved off at the last moment. And what Murray was just sharing, and we'll come to this in a little bit, the isolation bubble. Murray was just sharing that Dodi, Derek, and Eliza had never seen that story, even though they were a comparison close in Hong Kong. 
they've never seen it. My thanks to CBS News Archives and my, my dear colleague John Blackstone, CBS News San Francisco, who helped us get that tonight. Yes, indeed. Murray, we want to look at some more videotapes from when you were a dashing young foreign correspondent and still had hair before you became the oh so distinguished professor before us tonight. And the reason that we picked these clips was to show you some examples. What we're really trying to do is to paint a portrait, to show you some examples um, where we will all come to see the rich tapestry of your life, your life's work. And here is Murray on a reel. Murray Frompson reports now on Cambodia, where isolated skirmishes have grown into total war. Before the Civil War began, Cambodia was remembered for its rich history and exquisite beauty. Now she's become a tawdry lady ravished by neglect. This is what nearly five years of fighting has done to a small country. 10% of all Cambodians have been either killed or wounded. At least half of its 7 million people are classified as refugees. In 1970, no one seemed to realize that the seeds of another war in Indochina were being sown. Some prompted CBS News Moscow correspondent Murray Frompson to prepare this report. Among Mr. Brezhnev's chief concerns are how to unshackle the inefficient Soviet economy and how to deal with China. The United States figures prominently in both equations. Brezhnev is no Khrushchev. He's not talking about burying us. In fact, just the opposite. He wants us to bail him out with cash, credits, and technology. The Russians need all of these if they're ever to become an efficient superpower, economically as well as militarily. Murray Thompson reports. Bangladesh is still starving from a shortage of food and solutions to its staggering problems. The Bengalis are reminded of the food, energy, and inflationary crises elsewhere. But does it have any meaning to these haggard peasants who have made their way to Dhaka, their bodies wasting away from a lack of food? Who knows how many people have died or are dying from starvation, or from diseases that in one way or another are related to hunger? 5,000? 10? 50,000? Statistics are deceptive and meaningless, even obscene. I'll remind you again that all of the clips in long form, think of it as convergence, exist on the website. The address is at the uh, back of the programs. Uh, and I really do invite you to take a look. We wanted to give you a taste of Murray as a correspondent. And in turn, we have another series of clips, a montage of memories from his colleagues, uh, many of whom have sent audios and videos, and they are they're so heartfelt. So we wanted to give context to what it was like to be a foreign correspondent, and they help us do that. So we begin in Korea. It's about 1951. Murray was a reporter for Stars and Stripes. And here is CBS News, Bob Pierpoint. We used to make a drive all the way up along a dusty road from Seoul. We were staying in the Seoul billets, and uh, I was in a room next door to the room Murray was in. We were both sleeping in old army cots. Uh, and it was a long drive up there. It took us about, oh, 45 minutes to an hour to get to Panmunjom. And then we'd stand there in the dusty road in the summer of 1951 and argue with the communist correspondents who'd come down from Pyongyang, the communist headquarters in the capital city of Pyongyang, uh, North Korea. And... Uh, Murray and I and uh, other reporters would argue with the communist reporters. Murray and I uh, covered that Korean War until it ended. And then uh, Murray became an AP correspondent. And uh, we got together in Tokyo years later, in 1954, I believe it was. And uh, he was rooming with a guy named Sandy Sokolow, who worked for INS, and Murray worked for AP. and. I worked for CBS, and we used to go out at night and really rouse around Tokyo. I had a wonderful time, and uh, I won't go into much detail. It's too embarrassing. Just had to leave that last bit in. We, that, that Think of that as a tease. More to come. 
Marvin Kalb, CBS Marvin Kalb, covered Vietnam and Indonesia with Murray. Here's his recollection of one harrowing night in Jakarta while they were both caught in the middle of the Civil War. Murray, you and I go back several years, or should I say decades. I remember way back in 1957 when we first met in Jakarta, Indonesia, one of your early stops in a long and distinguished career in both journalism and the academy. I was visiting my brother Bernie, who was then the New York Times correspondent in Southeast Asia. There were no hotel rooms in Jakarta, at least none we could get. So if memory serves me well, we join you and Jim Wilde, you for the Associated Press, and Jim for Time Magazine, and we stayed in the damp and crowded garage in the back of a Canadian diplomat's home. Imagine, the Times, the AP, and Time all squeezed into a garage that seemed to be caught in an endless tropical downpour. By the way, did your mother know that's where you were staying? Murray was one, was among other things, one of the first U.S. Jewish journalists assigned as a bureau chief to Moscow at a time when neither word used as an adjective was very popular in the Soviet Union. Even getting a story had unique roadblocks, and you had to fend off allegations that you, in fact, were a spy. Sandy Sokolow, who you just saw, covered the first US USSR summits in the early 70s with Murray, and it was an experience that left Sokolow scarred. Here's Sokolow. Uh, Murray also, along with Doty, Doty was with Murray in the Far East all those years. And also, they lived many years in Moscow when the living wasn't very easy, it wasn't pleasant. The Cold War was still, was still going on, and coverage was really frustrating. Uh, American agencies weren't allowed to have their own cameras, and so they had to rely on Russian cameramen who did or didn't do what they were asked to do. The office manager of the day uh, was a KGB uh, operative. We all knew that, and we all knew that she was reporting back to the KGB on conversations and the memos and anything else she could figure out that was going on in the office. Uh, and uh, Murray was there during the 1972 Richard Nixon visit to Moscow. And uh, he and Doty uh, did valiantly uh, trying to be hospitable to an army of people including myself, who came uh, from New York for coverage of that, uh, that uh, historic event, but there's nobody remembers now. Um, so, so there's there's a lot of ser serious matters involved. I say Murray covered most of the important stories of the last 50 years of the 20th century. Frank McCullough is a very old friend of both Murray and my dad's, and he and Murray worked together in Reno. Frank was at the Reno City Gazette. Murray was at the AP. Frank is recovering from surgery tonight at his home in Sonoma. Uh, but his daughter, Candy, is going to read his recollections. Hi, this, my name is Frank McCullough. And like so many other people, I'm trying to address the, the uh, impossible retirement of Murray Fromson. But I made a few notes for myself in terms of what I wanted to say. But I just had cataract surgery and can't see the notes at all. So I asked my daughter Candy to read them for me, and here she is. Murray was a green, remarkably effective Associated Press correspondent with a cubicle just outside the Los Angeles Times when I was managing editor there. I can't remember why he wasn't in AP's main office down the street, but I have indelible memories of how fast and effectively he responded to any and everything I asked of him. I asked him one day, Murray, how in hell did you learn so much about this town so fast? His answer was a typical Fromsonism. That's my job. With AP, Murray was a solid professional in Saigon, where he served twice, Bangkok, and somewhere else I'm probably forgetting. Then to the chagrin of all of us print types, he moved to radio and television. It was neither accident nor surprise that he shot straight to the top there. I was back in the States when he took over the Moscow Bureau for CBS, and one of my brightest memories is of listening to his daily reports from there. This was a time when Moscow was the capital, not just of Russia, but the Soviet Union, whose hard-nosed, hard-edged old bosses didn't think much of a free press especially inland from Moscow. 
how Murray got away with those clear, crisp reports of what was really taking place inside the Soviet. But he did, and all of us should be thankful for that. Bernie Kalb's message has a wonderful lesson about Asia, along with a reference to a rather distinguished guest, such good company, UK. Listen to this one. Murray was then AP, I, New York Times, and between us, we gobbled up a lot of newsprint and maybe even had an impact on the shaping of U.S. foreign policy. But that's probably an egomaniacal illusion. Those were the dream days of foreign corresponding. A trench coat then was more than mere haberdashery. It was symbolic of a way of journalistic life, coattails flying as you dashed from one crisis to another. All this at a time when there was no email, no satellite phones, it took days for the Home Office to find you, pure deliciousness, so that each foreign correspondent was king of his own empire. In fact, Asia was our banquet. Asia, in all its turmoil, ideological, political, cultural, a thousand stories everywhere you looked, and we made the most of it. And I'd like to think Asia made the most of us. Marco Polo, Bernie Calm, Murray Fromson. But vignettes only tell so much of the story. What I really remember about Murray, and the same goes for me, I guess, was that we were a couple of kids in Asia filled with journalistic dreams, grappling to understand the new world that was emerging out of World War II, exhilarated that the world itself was our teacher, that journalism was like going to school all your life, you never stopped learning, that by some magic, including an expense account, though we would have worked for nothing, we were eyewitnesses to what would be in tomorrow's history books each new assignment of visa to a new world. And we eagerly scooped all this up. We never at the time knew we were accumulating memories, harvesting gold. We just dashed about interviewing presidents and dictators, covering wars, upheavals, coups, listening to Asia, sorting out the growing pains of these newly independent countries. Do you remember Marco's soundbite? Do you remember the soundbite from Marco? But Murray was not seduced by the banquet of Asia or its aroma. And in his work, in the C5A story, for example, which you saw, or the others, you could see how Murray's reports were grounded in solid reporting. And former CBS and NBC newsman Ed Fui has that. Murray Farmson and I were colleagues at CBS News for many years, starting with our time together in Saigon. I was sent out to Vietnam in the spring of 1967 to be the bureau chief for CBS. And Murray had been assigned to Bangkok, and part of that assignment meant that he was in and out of Vietnam every few months. So when I arrived in Saigon, I found an experienced and knowledgeable man who knew all about the war. He had been in and out many times. Murray and I engaged in a long conversation shortly after I arrived. I told him what the sentiment was in New York about the war, skeptical but generally supportive of President Johnson's policies. Murray said to me, this war is not winnable, at least not under the policies that we're following now. I was stunned. It was the experienced and reliable Murray Fromson telling me on my first week in Vietnam that this war I had been sent out to cover was not winnable. But I hadn't been there long before I came to the same conclusion that Murray had come to. The war was unwinnable, but it was Murray who was the first to see that. We've had a long and, I think, warm friendship since that spring of 1967, but I've never forgotten that it was Murray Fromson who was able to first see through the spin in Vietnam. We thought that we would, it was important to show those clips, and I, I hope you hope you enjoyed and get, begin to get some context. A few days ago, Murray Annenberg received this message from Sid Shanberg. And if I may, I'm just going to read a short portion of it, an excerpt, because it captures the essence of what you give up and get in return as a foreign correspondent. I'm just going to share a couple of graphs. I first met Murray in Phnom Penh in the 1970s. At some point during the five-year war to save Cambodia from the barbarians at the gates, like many of us who started out with typewriters and carbon paper and hot type, Murray's life has been rich and full of discovery. We have had paid educations and we have witnessed things we never dreamed of when we decided to pursue the reporter's life. Some of these images were catastrophes and slaughters. And, one, and while one is tempted to say I could have done without witnessing such carnage and barbarity, 
I know Murray would agree that it was important that we were there to bear witness. I repeat, a reporter's life is a good life, an honorable way to spend one's passage here. That has been and will continue to be Murray Fromson's life. And finally, Bob Heyman from the Freedom Forum wrote to you just today because you handed it to me, so I know that it just arrived in the mail. He was quoting Nelson Pointer, but in accolades to you, quote, the real secret of life is not just to make a living and not just to make a mark, but to make a difference, unquote. Continuing, he writes, you have made a difference, my friend, both in the profession and in the academy. We're moving quickly. The years as a journalist were prologue to your contributions and achievements here at Annenberg. And to give equal time, good journalism is balanced, and I know you'd accept none other tonight. We have two perspectives from both colleagues and former Annenberg students. And we begin with a faculty colleague, media law and media history professor and former dean of the graduate school, Professor John Cotler. Can I hold your plate? back to the, uh, the autumn of 1985, and as the, the newest pledge of Delta House, actually the newest faculty member here at the School of Journalism, uh, Dean Wormer, Bryce Nelson, our director, has sentenced me to teach Journalism 190, Introduction to Journalism. It's a thankless task involving taking 150 semi-conscious freshmen every morning <laughs> across 300 years of American media history in 15 weeks. Daunting enough, but to make matters worse, Bryce decided and told me about it immediately before the beginning of the semester that the class should be used to introduce each of our regular faculty members to our freshman students. Suddenly, Journalism 190 became a series of variety acts and I had become Ed Sullivan. <laughs> we have people like Bill Faith, our public relations professor who had been Bob Hope's publicist, regaling 18-year-olds with tales of journeying down various roads with Bob Hope and Francis, Francis Langford and Dorothy Lamour, who he kept on calling Dottie. <laughs> to 150 faces who had never heard of any of these people. <laughs> we had Joe Saltzman telling our youngsters how he and Al Gore had invented broadcasting. <laughs> and on and on. And then it was time for Murray. faculty during this interminably long semester. <laughs> Murray was the only one who came in costume. <laughs> and he spoke of his life as a foreign correspondent, hither and yon. And after he left, I told our suddenly awakened students, that not only had Murray really been a foreign correspondent, but that yes, he also played one on television. <laughs> later though, years later, it actually dawned on me that Murray Fromson, the journalist, and Murray Fromson, the person, were really one and the same. If, any, if ever anybody had been born to a calling, been born to a profession, it had been Murray as a journalist. It's been said often, you've all heard it, that the real job of a journalist is to speak the truth to and in the face of authority. If that's the case, and I believe it to be the case, then you all know why Murray was destined to be a journalist. 
For Murray, there simply could be no other way. There is no other way. Even after he had received his father's admonition, Laertes had nothing on Murray, who has remained true to his and to journalism's principles for his entire life. You all know the drill. Seek the truth, uncover the truth, speak the truth, and damn the consequences. It was a journalism prior to the rise of the bean counters. It was a journalism that lured each of us here. And it was and is the journalism of Murray Fromson. It always will be. It's funny how when retirement approaches, you inevitably hear talk about legacies. What did it all mean? What did I mean? With a person like Murray, one hardly knows where to begin. Let me suggest a few markers, though, to you. We take for granted, certainly young reporters do, students do, that there are institutions like the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press and that they've always been there to fight the good fight on behalf of access to government, on behalf of freedom of information, on behalf of uh, journalists depressed every place. And so it seems, except that they weren't always there. And their genesis was in the mind of Murray Fromson in 1970. And it wasn't just this organization that Murray took up the cause with. Following the Reporters Committee, Murray was active as a board member, which is where I first met him, on the old California Freedom of Information Committee. And then likewise on the California First Amendment Coalition. Always, always serving the cause of truth. Here at USC, and it's now very vogue, very chic to be talking about international this and international that, Ray Fromson started the USC Center for International Journalism in 1985, 20 years ago. And his legacy is in the person of, of individual reporters and news executives all over the world who are Fromson products as a result of that program for which, over a period of 10 years, Murray raised all the money without the university lifting its collective corporate finger. Not at all. Murray did it. It was Murray's program. On a micro level, these are macro things, on a micro level, you should know that Murray was a person who would and did put his own career on the line when in the face of administrative authority, Murray basically said, you fire this staff person, you're going to have to fire me too. And the administrator backed down, and that person is still with us. Murray's legacy is a reminder that the world isn't as complex as the spinmeisters would have us believe, and that problems usually have simple solutions. Murray's legacy is that the truth is definable and knowable, and that ethics aren't, are not, are not situational. And Murray's legacy, with apologies to Bob Woodward, is that most good work is done in the defiance of authority. And finally, on a personal level, Murray's legacy is the eternal optimism and hope that someday, somehow, somewhere, the San Francisco 49ers will rise again. <laughs> I count myself lucky, really lucky, for the past quarter of a century during which Murray has been my mentor, my colleague, most of all, Murray, most of all, my friend. Thank you.
another member of the faculty, one of the really great figures in the entire field of radio broadcasting, is with us. He's been called the Grand Master of the American Radio Theater, the Poet Laureate of Radio. He's a distinguished member of this faculty and a longtime Frompson friend, Professor Norman Corwin. I uh, regret that uh, the freight handlers who were bringing my speech uh, have been detained. I spent uh, all last night trimming it so that it wouldn't run into the commencement. <laughs> and um, uh, I uh, regret that uh, I will not uh, entertain you beyond midnight. Uh, but uh, I did want to uh, establish that I am a, a um, Fromsonista <laughs> and uh, hope to remain that in that capacity for an indefinite period. Um, I, um, I, th I think that... Um, there is a wry and amiable uh, irony in the fact that um, Murray, an eminent journalist, as you all know, um, that Murray was brought up in an orphanage. And the, the twist on that is that uh, he has emerged as a, a strong family man, not only in the sense of the eminence of his own family here and abroad, but uh, he was indeed a surrogate father to a number of USC students in uh, traveling abroad. Uh, on credit, and uh, uh, he he is the true father of the committee of reporters for the uh, for the what is it um, Murray the uh, freedom of speech, and with emphasis on the First Amendment, which has its work cut out for it today. Um, Murray um, has, as you've heard, been there and done that, and uh, he uh, has been in theaters of war and of crisis for a great part of his journalistic career. Uh, I... Uh, uh, I uh, regret that I uh, will not be able to carry on for long, um, but uh, there was, I, I w want to refer to um, one of his least accomplishments uh, of, of recent date. He was on television in a debate with a right winger, and uh, throughout, this deb throughout this debate, Murray was smiling, he was confident, he was uh, amusing, he was informative, uh, whereas his opponent spoke with the solemnity of a, and anger of a defrocked bishop. <laughs> and uh, as a result of that uh, experience of listening to Murray, being inspired by him, I, for the first time since uh, the last two administrations, uh, thought I might make it, I might live until, until the uh, bishoprics of, the, of, of Washington were cleaned out. <laughs> and uh, uh, I now have that confidence. Um, I... Uh, have been. I've listened and watched 
to my edification and with great emotion the clips from abroad, that harrowing clip on the, uh, his ad lib reaction to the death of the orphan, orphans. And uh, I go away a sadder and more informed man than when I arrived. And uh, I wish Dodie and Murray nothing but the best, which they eminently deserve and have given. Thank you. And there are some students. Students who are at work around the globe tonight, some 115 graduates in all, which I think is also merits applause. Absolutely. <laughs> this next montage includes Benjamin Sands of The Voice of America. Can we connect? Rosanna Fuentes, Managing Editor of Foreign Affairs Quarterly for Latin America and Mexico City. Dan Browning, Investigative Reporter for the Minneapolis Star Tribune. And Professors Leslie Werspa and Trish O'Kane. Here are just some portions of their very poignant greetings. Mary was such a good fundraiser and has been such a good fundraiser all of his life that he really provided for a lot of Mexican, I would, Mexicans, I would say, a generation of Mexican journalists owe their uh, graduates to the, uh, st studies to Mary. Mary and Dottie opened their home for us Mexicans when we were up in Los Angeles. It was a time in which uh, none of us was very clear about where the U.S.-Mexican relationship will lead us to. Tio Mary. Tú eres un mexicano por adopción. You know that we in Mexico, all of us that had been working with you for all these years because you were a mentor and it, you changed our lives by giving us that opportunity of higher education. But for all of us, you're a very special americano. You're a very special mexicano-americano and you're a very special Mexican. I'm literally, I'm recording this from my hotel room in Kabul in Afghanistan. I've been here for, I don't know, for about a week now. I'm covering the Christian convert trial. They're, you know, they're talking about killing this guy for rejecting Islam and so forth. Obviously, dream job for me, right? Because I'm Jewish. I'm from New York. I work for the U.S. government. It's great. My driver this morning asked me if I was a heathen. So, ideal post. And honestly, honestly, Murray, I absolutely would not be here if it wasn't for you. You know, I remember the first time we actually sat down to talk, and it was over there in Annenberg down the lobby, because I remember I was trying to get more money so I could go to Hong Kong for the summer. And I'll never forget, you said with absolute assurance, no problem, you would make sure I got extra thousands of dollars. And I remember thinking you were completely out of your mind, and I did not believe a word you said. But you actually came through, and you, you have never stopped being there for me. There have just been so many times when I didn't think I could do this, when I didn't think I could be a journalist and when I was ready to give up. And you've always just been an incredibly enthusiastic presence. You are, to me, a perfect mentor, good advice, free food, and uh, a really, a really inspiring example. Murray was never just a teacher. He was never just a journalist. He taught us, of course, through his own history and exemplary professional career. But he simultaneously encouraged us with uncommon zest, always demanding that we push ourselves just a little bit further, that we think a little bit more critically, that we probe those unobvious aspects of an issue 
a story, or a trend. There are many teachers in this world. There are many journalists in this world. But there are not very many people who will put their own ambitions and projects on hold temporarily to be there for young people as mentors. Or not so young people, perhaps. Mentorship takes time. It takes empathy. It takes networking. Murray, in the ten years that I have known him, has never failed to rise to this complex task. I was a fellow in the Center for International Journalism in 1989 and 1990 under Murray Fromson. It was one of the best years of my life. Murray brought together a dozen or so journalists from the United States and Latin America and helped us learn from each other. He acted as father confessor to some, medical advisor to others, and always the consummate journalist. I may have saved Murray's life one time when he was choking choking on a tortilla chip in a restaurant in Tijuana. If anyone asks, by the way, the Heimlich maneuver works just fine. At the time, I didn't realize how much good I had done. Murray got us interviews with newsmakers, took us dancing in Havana, helped us get jobs. And I'm thrilled to say he even came to my wedding in St. Louis. Back then, I worked at the Post-Dispatch. I don't believe he ever asked for anything in return, except that we do good journalism. Some people in your life are like signposts that say, right turn here or bridge out ahead. For me, Murray Fromson is the Pan American Highway, stretching from here to Patagonia. The meta mentor who introduced me to other mentors through his international journalism program, Murray helped guide me towards a career in human rights journalism, activism, and teaching. This journey began in Los Angeles, took me to Nicaragua and Guatemala for 10 years, and continues in the Deep South. In addition to all the doors he opened for me, Murray has taught me one essential life lesson as a teacher. Show your students that you care. My New Orleans home was near a levee that broke, and it sat in 11.5 feet of oily water for three weeks. We evacuated to Alabama, where we thought we'd stay a few days. I had left my desktop computer at home, and I had no cell phone. Our landline stopped working three days after the hurricane. So you can imagine my surprise when I was evacuated, lying on a strange bed in a strange place, trying to figure out how my new strange phone worked, and I realized there was a message on it from none other than Murray Fromson. I've often wondered if Murray secretly implanted all of us with microchips during the program because he found me in Guatemala, he found me in London when I was having an international relationship disaster meltdown, and he found me when I was curled up in a fetal position in evacuation limbo. This Christmas, my Irish mother said to me, that wee professor of yours really keeps up with you. Every year or so, I get a call. Where is she? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome two of Murray's Annenberg students and current Los Angeles anchormen talk about convergence. Mark Brown from KBC7 and Frank Buckley from KTLA5. Well, Murray, it's it's not really fair for the two of us to represent not, not hundreds of students, I think thousands of students who've learned from Murray Fromson, and as you've heard, were mentored by Murray Fromson, and who at times feared Murray Fromson. (laughs) But we also wanted to be like Murray Fromson. We loved the adventures of the correspondent. We wanted to live that life ourselves. And Murray, you set the standard for all of us who have followed you into this business. I've been lucky enough to, to work in this profession since graduating. Uh, in 1987, I've had worked in local news, worked at CNN for six years, and I too had a chance to travel the world and be a witness to history. And I, I truly believe without the USC journalism program, I wouldn't have had those opportunities. And without Murray Fromson, I wouldn't have come to USC. Because I, I, while I knew early in my life I had that passion to become a journalist, and I knew I had to attend college. Uh, My father was a grunt. He was a hospital corpsman. And a kid from 29 Palms, the son of a grunt, doesn't come to USC. But I applied for a scholarship. I 
know. I was, I was going to try not to get emotional here. <clears throat> Ever since I started anchoring, they say, show your emotion. You know, they, they want us to be like, they want us to be like Anderson Cooper now. And I... I, I, I had applied to UCLA, and I'd been accepted there. Uh, but Murray was on the judging committee for the RTNA scholarship, and he said, why don't you apply to USC? And I said, you know, uh, we just can't afford that. And I don't know how he did it, and some other students have talked about it, but he said, we will make it happen for you. We will make it affordable. And so that's how I ended up at USC. And Murray, I am indebted to you. More Anderson Cooper here. And I thank you. Um, I, th I think all of us who've been touched by Murray over the years would say that in some ways he was like a parent to us. In the way that a parent teaches a child right from wrong, you taught us right from wrong in journalism. And I still hear your voice. You taught us, you reached us, and we will keep teaching what we learn from you to the next generation, and we will try to do it right. So thank you. My parents wanted me to be a lawyer. Toyed with the idea, thought about it, uh, decided to take the journalism course of action and to uh, major in journalism. And there are certain key periods in one's life. Everybody has them. There, you know, we talked about signposts along the way. There are people and places that we collide with or meet with. And Murray Fromson was one of those people that made a huge difference in my decision to pursue journalism and to pursue it seriously. Sometimes, especially in local TV news, you see people who pursue journalism and they're not pursuing it all that seriously. And you see the results. What I try to do whenever I'm involved in a story is think about how Murray would do it. I've seen examples of Murray's reporting, of course, we, you know, during our uh, taking his class, learning from him. He would tell stories about some of the things that he had covered, and uh, one of them was the siege at Quezon. And he talked about landing in the, the C-7 and how it couldn't actually land on the runway. They would push the cargo out the back, and he would be along for the ride on the cargo as it was slipping out of the plane. There's mortar rounds being fired all over the place and machine gun fire. And he talked about falling down and skidding on his knees down that metal airport tarmac, that temporary tarmac that was made. And I thought, anybody who can do that in the pursuit of a story is somebody I should listen to and somebody I should learn from. And so what I do now and what I've always done and what I will continue to do is if I have any trouble with what I'm involved in, with, if I'm doing a story and I want to, and I can't quite wrap my arms around it. I, I try to, I'm trying to write it and I'm having trouble, whatever it happens to be. Is this something that Murray Fromson would write? Is this something that Murray Fromson would say? And if it sounds like it's something that he would do, then I'm comfortable with it. So I'd like to thank you for the way you've inspired me. You've given me something to which I can aspire. I have failed miserably at it thus far in my life, but I'm going to keep trying. <laughs> Murray Fromson, thank you for everything. Murray, come on up. 
some thought was given as we began to having teed up a bit of a, the background, it was time to actually hear from Murray. And <laughs> I'm going to start off, but there are microphones, and we have both Derek and Drew, I believe, out there who will be bringing them around, I believe. So we'll give you a chance in a couple of moments as well. How's it working for you so far? <laughs> I don't have enough handkerchiefs. In the box? <laughs> well, it's been great hearing from so many people who I admire, I love, I respect, and who have reminded me of some incredible days in my life. Uh, that I've been able to share with young people, with audiences, and so forth. And the irony is that uh, as we sit here today and talk about this, is here I have my family in front of me. They've never seen any of these films because at the time we were living overseas, they never sent us copies of what, what I'd done, and you didn't have satellites, as you know, remember that. And it's, uh, it's just incredible. Nobody's sitting there saying, what, did that really happen? <laughs> Yes. Well, she was with us, with me on a lot of them, so she knows it happened. And we're going to invite her up in a couple of minutes as well. Let's play the lightning round here for a little bit. on my stopwatch, but I won't sure. bring it out. Favorite story, 30 seconds, just quick, just off the top. Hey, Hello, I'm here. a producer. As it walks on water, it's 30 seconds. <laughs> favorite story and why? Well, I wouldn't call it favorable. I'd call it memorable. Memorable? And that was the one you'd watched here, the C5A. Because it wasn't just the story you saw, it's what I learned later. And most reporters know that you never really know the whole story when you're reporting it. But what I found later was that the surviving orphans on that plane all suffered from hypoxia, loss of oxygen, and were irreparably brain damaged the rest of their lives. And their, their adopted parents had this burden on them. And five or six years after the crash, I was called, I had left CBS, and I was called by a law firm in Washington. And they said, we're representing the children who survived. And we'd like you to come and testify about the C5A crash. And I said, reporters don't testify, I'm sorry. And they, then they began to explain what had happened. The lying, the deceptive nature of the story spun by the administration, spun by Lockheed Aircraft and the U.S. Air Force. I was so outraged, I said, the hell to it. I'll come to you. I'll come testify. So I sat through six weeks of listening to testimony before the actual trial began. The lead-off witness was a young girl who had been thrown from the plane who I helped put on a helicopter to get out. She's a, she was a cripple to begin with. And uh, now she's teaching in Oakland, California. Uh, but there's, there's more to this story. Let's set it up a little bit, because I wanted to talk about this anyway. Yeah. The C5A program was a, was a program gone awry. The jets were grounded. They patched together parts to make a single flying jet and brought it in from Sacramento. It got to Vietnam. They loaded it up. That was the story before the trip. Hmm. It was then all... there is the post the post crash investigation and the fall. The yeah. question: Why do? What's the lesson from all this? Why do we do such a poor job in following up stories? What's your take? Well, I, I just think it's the nature of the business. You're if you're a spot reporter, you're going off and doing the stories that are right in front of you, and you go on to something else, and you don't have the opportunity to follow it up because maybe you're not based in the area where the story occurred. Uh, I know when that investigation came to trial in Washington, D.C., in the federal district court in front of Judge Louis Oberdorfer, a great judge, a great attorney who Ed Guthman knows from his days in the civil rights movement. The Washington press just ignored this story. They just didn't cover it. It wasn't on their mindset. They were busy with all the garbage in Washington, and they didn't think about this C-5A crash. Uh, but the, the, the deceptive nature of it, at one point, one of the lawyers for the children 
said to the judge, Your Honor, we'd like to see all the footage that the Air Force shot uh, at the time of the crash. They do that for every crash. They go in and they film immediately everything around them. And uh, both Lockheed and the Air Force said, well, no, the film was lost in a fire. And uh, yeah. <laughs> the lawyer said, Your Honor, they're lying. And Oberdorfer turned to them and he said, Gentlemen, I want you to produce all film, still photos, evidence you have of that crash in the next 24 hours or I'll lock you up. Uh, 24 hours later, 50,000 feet of film and still pictures showed up. And it was incredible because it showed what had happened. And it showed that this plane was bound to crash. It was put together with chewing gum and bailing wire up in Sacramento, Travis Air Force Base. We didn't know that at the time we covered the story. Here it is five, six years later I'm finding out. And that's the frustration that journalists have. We can't always get the complete story. Uh, and it didn't get much ink for a long time. But I do remember one irony. The project director who selected the Lockheed C-5A plane, a major general, also became the investigative officer of the crash. And what the judge wouldn't let into the trial was that this man had been wined and dined in Paris and London by Lockheed and expense accounts. It showed the whole thing. And it was just one of those things that, you know, everything else was going on in the world. This, it often happens in journalism. You don't, you're, over, you're, over, you're overtaken by events. And uh, this story never had much mileage after that. Uh, it finally took an act of Congress to allocate enough money to give each of the surviving orphans $100,000. You know what $100,000 goes for a child who's irreparably brain damaged? For a whole lifetime, these well-meaning people who adopted these children had this burden to live with. So that's why I say the C-5A, not the most, not the humorous, not the funniest, certainly the most tragic, but it tells us something about the need for journalists to be skeptical, investigative, persistent, dogmat dogmatic. That's, what that, that's my feeling about that story. And it lives with me to this day. There's another story about follow-up which really segues nicely. I mean, this story really actually includes Dodie and Elisa, I think maybe Derek, but it's, I'm really thinking about the massacre. Yeah. I'm thinking about the massacre. Let me set it up for folks just real quickly that there was a U.S. Marine massacre. About seven farmers, Vietnamese farmers, were executed for the mistaken belief that they were V.C. <coughs> You covered that. Take us now to what happened when you went back. Well, that happened in 1968. And in 1991, 92, 95, I can't remember exactly. Aliza, my daughter, our daughter, was living in Israel. And of course, she had never, like the rest of the family, had never seen any of the footage of the stories I'd done. And she knew I was going back to Vietnam with Dodie. And she said, I want to come. I want to see Vietnam through your eyes. Derek, I think, was in Mexico at the time. So he couldn't come. He was working. So Elisa flew to Bangkok and then came up to Hanoi. And we then began this trip. And when I got to Hue, I insisted on trying to go back to this hamlet where this massacre had taken place. I was curious of what the consequences were of these many years later. <coughs> And uh, Dodi and I went looking for this hamlet, and we couldn't find it. And finally, the pr province chief knew we were serious, so he took us to this hamlet. Twenty-seven children were orphaned by this massacre, and three of the widows had survived. And we began to talk to them. It was horrendous what had happened. I can't begin to describe to you how bloody this treatment was. And it tells, it tells you something about war. It's, I mean, these kids who got involved in this massacre, they did terrible things. But that's what war does to you. I mean, people in this country, for the most part, I think, are 
I've seen war in a sanitized way. Movies, television, heroes. It's a dirty, rotten business. I've covered 14 wars. I'll tell you, we don't need war. We don't, just don't need it. It never solves anything. But, <laughs> but um, um, one of the widows said, uh, would you like to see my husband's grave? And I said, yes. So Dodi and Aliza and I went through this rice paddy to this gravesite, and where she was lighting with her one of her sons, who was light, were lighting jaw sticks. And by the way, the son was kind of grinning, and when we first met, and Alisa said to me, I "Wonder what he's grinning about? What's so funny?" So I asked the woman. I said, "Who is this?" She says, "This is my son. He's 37 years old." I said, "Yeah, yes." He said, "I was pregnant with him when my husband was murdered." He said, "And he was born." I had a bad delivery, and he was damaged by it. But here the son came with her, and we went out to this grave site. They were lighting jaw sticks, and there was another grave right near it. And I asked the woman, a lovely gray-haired woman of 60, 65 years old, I said, whose grave is that? He said, oh, that's my daughter. My daughter was killed by an accidental marine shell the day before. And I think we were just kind of overwhelmed by it all. This is a shorthand version of the story, obviously. And she took us by the hand, this woman, this elderly woman, from a culture far different from her own. And she said, war is really terrible, isn't it? It makes people so sad. And I think we just, <laughs> we all just went, <laughs> burst into tears. And that was the end of that story. But what, I, what happened was that when we went there, 27 years later, those people didn't know that the Marines had been arrested, court-martialed, and punished. None of the Marine, no Marine officer, no member of the South Vietnamese government came back to that little poor, hard-scrabble hamlet to apologize or to offer them compensation of any kind. It wasn't until we went there and told them what had happened that they'd heard anything resembling a, a, rationale, a, a punishment for the people who who ruined their lives in many ways. Add one thing. The man, of course. The man followed us around, and he's a noted, and he remembered you, and you remembered Bill Peel, and Rosemary's here. That's right. Rosemary's here, but Rosemary, too, is here, I know, somewhere in the okay. audience. Yeah, that, that's right. This man is <laughs> just here with all these years later. This Vietnamese man was at the edge of the crowd smiling, and Aliza saw him. She said, this man is smiling like he knows you. And I went up to him, and it turns out he was an Arvin soldier. And he had been in the village in 1968. And he said, I know you. You came here with a tall, gray-haired man, Bill Tui, of the Los Angeles Times, to investigate this story. And here it was all these years later. So, you know, these memories are indelible. This, this next, uh, these four stories, these four moments all have a Murray Frompson out cue. I'm just dying to figure out how he's going to weave a story among the four. What do, what does sitting on LBJ's lap, <laughs> marching with Martin Luther King in Selma, standing with Sakharov on Gorky Street, and what were you doing in a Balinese sauna with Hubert Humphrey? <laughs> go ahead. Take your best shot. Well, back, I'll go back to front because it's kind of interesting. Humphrey was a great liberal, and all of us who grew up as liberals loved him at that time, but really got angry at him. But he, he was angry at us. I mean, he wanted to be president of the United States very badly. And he was a hawk on Vietnam. He was for the war. And. Um, we wanted to interview him. We were in Indonesia, we were in Bali, and we asked for an interview, and uh, Ron Ross of the Minneapolis Tribune and I, and they said, well, he's in the sauna. You go in there and you see whether he'll see you. And Humphrey came out wrapped in this huge Turkish towel. He said, God damn it, why don't you guys get on the team and report the war right? And I said, you know, we heard the same damn thing in 1963 from Admiral Harry Felt. He said, why don't you guys get on the team? Well, that's what people, that's what Washington wanted, get people on the team. 
And, you know, I, th I think that I always say that one of, the, one of the problems with my friends and colleagues and people I admire and like in Washington is they're victims of the virus of access. Play the game. You can get sources if you play the game. So it took us to LBJ's lap. So LBJ, I, I had come back from a, a trip to the Far East <clears throat> where I had run into a, an admiral who said he had nuclear weapons and was prepared to use them against the Chinese in 1960. I'd been to Kimoy and Matsu, these offshore islands, which was a big dominant story in those days. I mean, uh, in 1958, the Washington Star published, printed on the front page every day for 63 days running, above the fold, stories about Kimoy and Matsu and the shelling of these islands. At the same time as below the fold was Eisenhower orders the National Guard into Little Rock. <laughs> I mean, it was just bizarre. But anyway, uh, I came back from there, and I, I was supposed to be carrying, covering Henry Cabot Lodge, and I got switched to Johnson. I went to Shawnee, Oklahoma, and I got on a plane, and Bill Moyers was there with George Reedy. And he said, hi, I haven't seen you in a while. What have you been doing? And I told him, and Reedy said, holy God. He ran up to the front of the plane, he whispered something in Johnson's ear. And Johnson <laughs> stood up and he... <laughs> so I kind of walked up and I said, Senator, yes, uh, what, what is it? He says, I hear you have an interesting story to tell me about Kimoy and Matsu. <laughs> and I said, uh, well, I said, it's interesting to me. I don't know if it's interesting to you. He said, well, sit down. So I sat down and he put his boots up and Listen, and I told him the story. This admiral was saying, uh, he told us what we're doing in Masu was to stop the Chinese from crossing the border in Laos, and, you know, he could nuke South China if they got out of land. Johnson got up, he stretched, and he said, my boy, let me tell you something. He says, never trust them fat-ass admirals and generals. They'll screw you every time. <laughs> and I thought, Forty or five years later in Vietnam, why didn't he take his own advice? <laughs> but you know, in, in fairness, I have to say that uh, Johnson was an amazing, amazing political figure. I think history is going to treat him much more kindly when it's all over. He's still remembered for Vietnam, but I covered the march from Selma with Martin Luther King, and that was a great moment in my life, memory. I was standing next to John Lewis when he was beaten by the sheriff's deputies trying to get over the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And we got into Montgomery and I, I co-anchored the live broadcasting of the arrival. And subsequently, I think Peter was talking about the fact that first you were a reporter in CBS's eyes and then you became a correspondent. So that night, Gordon Manning was telling me, well, you're no longer a reporter, you're a correspondent. And just as he said that, we were having dinner in the Holiday Inn, and I mean, this one of the producers, Peter Herford, walked in and said, you got to get down the road. They said, there's been a white woman bushwhacked on the road in Viola Liuzu. I busted out of there with the crew, and we went down there. By the time we got there, the body had been removed. And we went down to Selma, and there were about eight or ten other reporters. We knew they were in the city hall, and the doors were locked, and we just waited. And finally, this terrible guy, I mean, a caricature that only Hollywood could invent, Sheriff Jimmy Clark. He came out and he said, well, fellas, what do you want to know? I said, well, Jimmy, what went on in there with the FBI? He said, well, he said, I want to know what happened down there, and that woman, he said, you know, and the niggers did it. And we said, what? You know, it was, I mean, that was the way it was. That was what... Selma, Alabama was like in 1965. But the, 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 the most important point was she was, a, she was a symbol of what had, of people who were fighting for the rights of people, American citizens, to vote. And it was simply the culmination of all of that that led to Lyndon Johnson's ability to get the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act perhaps the most important piece of legislation in this last century. And he got it, as Ed Guthman reminds me, 
by one vote delivered by Edmund, Edward Dirksen, Republican from Illinois. But Johnson, Johnson did it, and I think he'll be remembered historically. Well, we promised you a three-handkerchief event, <laughs> and I hope you all took advantage of that. Peter, thank you for your magnificent job in putting this together tonight. This isn't exactly a retirement party. It's a transitional party. The family that you have that's so magnificent, which we've all had the chance to celebrate tonight, extends to the Annenberg family and always will. And Murray will be a professor emeritus of journalism, and I know that he will continue to be deeply involved. He'll also continue to be a writer. Uh, in fact, on your way out, you're going to get his latest column in case you've missed it. Um, and Murray, I just want to tell one story that I mentioned at the journalism school meeting today because it's a, it's a story about how Murray's legacy continues and will always continue. And it's a story from an email that you received this morning or yesterday. You've heard a lot tonight about the International Journalism Program. You've also heard a lot about Murray's dedication to uh, the free flow of information and the importance that journalists and citizens be able to get information as the core of a democracy. And you've heard about his work in creating the Reporters Committee for the press, for freedom of the press. Well, the email that he got was from one of those students. Was it the person in the film here? It was the woman you saw from Mexico. And she had been inspired by Murray telling her day in and day out, and week in and week out, about the importance of the Freedom of Information Act and of getting free information. And she, like so many, had been troubled for so many years by the dirty war in Mexico, in which so many people were killed, the lies were told, the truth was hidden. And so she actually led the fight to establish the Freedom of Information Act in Mexico and to get all the information out about the dirty war and to expose the horrors that took place. And she sent Murray an email telling him that in all of her work in making that happen, it was Murray that had been her inspiration. Murray, you'll remain an inspiration for your students and for all of us for all time. And you'll also remain a member of our family. And as always, Murray gets the last word. I just want to tell you the postscript to that story. Uh, Rosanna said to me, check our website, the FOI website in Mexico. And so I went to Google last night. This is a story been hidden from the Mexican people throughout their history. There were nine million hits about the dirty war in Mexico. Right.